We have seen that for any continuum mechanics problem, we need three equations. The equilibrium equations, the kinematic equations, and the constitutive equations. In this video, we're going to see how we develop the kinematic equations. First of all, try to imagine a solid that is going to be subjected to a force on the top and it is anchored here at the bottom. When you apply a force to such solid, you would expect this solid to move from left to right. So what you would expect is that if this is the undeformed configuration, after you apply the force then this solid is going to look something like what I'm going to uh, to draw right now. And you may also expect that this solid is going to have stretching in this section and a compression in this section. Now, how you calculate that stretching and that contraction is going to be done what we know as the kinematic equations. And this is the plot that you have here on the left, which is actually, actually a numerical solution of the problem I mentioned before, and where you can see with the arrows what are called the displacement vectors. For example, here at the top left corner, we see that this corner in the deformed conf configuration moves to this point over here, and the top right cor corner moves right and down, opposite to the top left corner that moves right and up. Now, how we relate the displacements to strains is what the displacement uh, what the kinematic equations are going to do. So our objective then is going to be here to link displacements, which are vectors, to strains, which are go we're going to see it's a tensor, similar to the stress tensor. But let's start with an, an easy example and an easy explanation. And let's look at this plot over here. Let me make it this a little bit bigger. Uh, here we have three cases in which we deform a cube. Notice that we have three elements, one, two, and three, perpendicular to the paper. We have this cube that we deform it in three different ways. The first um, type of deformation is the one that we stretch the cube just in direction one. When the cube stretches in direction one and it goes into the new shape here with the dashed line, this phase is going to experience a displacement u1, or in this case delta u1. If I want to calculate the deformation based on the theory of small strains, that's going to be given by the change of length delta u1 divided the original length in the undeformed configuration which is delta x1. That's what we call the linear strain epsilon 1 1 and this refers to the deformation the normal deformation in direction one and you can do the same for direction number two for example you can stretch it and uh, you would get a, in this case the strain or linear strain in direction two that links displacements in direction 2, that's the first subscript, related to the original, original length in direction 2 as well. And you can do the same thing for direction 3, right? So in general, in three dimensions, we're going to have that the strain tensor is going to be composed by, similarly to the stress tensor, is going to be a matrix 
and this matrix let me have a little more space over here is going to be equal to epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 epsilon 3 3 in the diagonal elements and this is going to be equal we're going to write here the rest of the equation as we have seen in our previous uh, graph over here if we take this into infinitesimal change changes and we use the theory of calculus then this is going to be actually a partial derivative of displacement one in, the, in direction one displacement two in direction two and displacement three in direction three and these are what are called linear strains notice that the, these linear strains which are in the diagonal they do affect the volume of the element if you have some of this change then uh, very likely that's going to change the volume of the element and we're going to see that that's linked to something which is called volumetric strain but for now let's just keep it uh, to that and let's try to see what are these other strains that we see over here all right so in this uh, new type of deformation here instead of stretching the solid in a particular direction we're going to distort the shape of the solid and here for simplicity i didn't draw the original shape of the cube but it's just a cube as the other ones with the right angles but after i apply here a certain stress i distort the shape of the solid in the plane one two such that i distort the angles of this original what was originally a cube it's not a cube anymore and i distort that angle so i have a distortion angle that now characterizes that deformation or that distortion if you know this, if I wanted to compute what this actual angle is between uh, here and there, these two lines that I'm indicating with the mouse, what I would have to do is I would have to calculate the arc tangent of this uh, angle, which is given by delta u1, the displacement, divided delta x2, which is the length. If I do the arc tangent of that, I would get this angle. But if I have deformations which are small enough, I can approximate the tangent of such an angle to just delta u1 divided delta x2. And I can do the same for this other angle, which in this case is going to be symmetric. And that this is just going to be delta u2 divided delta x1. And if I take the average of those two angles, this is going to be the equation that characterizes that angle. So this equation that we see right here is just a quantification of the distortion angle when I apply this type of deformation. And this type of deformation or this type of distortion of the shape is a shear strain and it's applied by a shear stress. And we call it epsilon 1, 2. And as I was saying before, it's given by the equation that we see over here and we can generalize that too when we take that to very small uh, displacement to what I'm going to write just in a minute but let me let me just complete the matrix here the tensor this is going to look like this and I'm just going to complete what I started writing And each of those is going to be given by the equations that I'm going to write right here, which are exactly the same as the ones that I have in the in my notes. But now we are extending this to the general case. So for the plane one three, now it's going to be displacement in direction one 
relative to length in direction 3 and a similar thing for the other strains this one is going to be u2 the x3 and du3 the x2 and I'm going to clean up this in a minute and this is a symmetric matrix so I'm not going to write the other elements but it's just the same all right so let me fix this and this is going to be what is called the strain tensor and similar to the stress tensor we're going to have eigenvalues eigenvectors uh, actually the the two what we're going to pursue in the next lecture is a relationship between these two because they are intimately linked and these two are uh, tensors or uh, mathematically uh, matrices with uh, six independent values all right there is uh, just uh, one more thing i'd like to do for this lecture and this is something very important and it is uh, to understand what is the volumetric strain as we were saying before the linear strains like epsilon 1 1 epsilon 2 2 and epsilon 3 3 can cause a change of volume in the element and if i add up all the linear strains i obtain what is called the volumetric strain which is just adding up all the linear strains in the strain tensor and you can see a demonstration about that in example 3.1 is it's just a, by the definition of volumetric strain you can obtain the equation i just wrote and which is in my notes as equation 3.8 physically what i want to highlight is that linear strains do cause volumetric strain but shear strains which are in the off diagonal terms they do not cause volumetric strains as long as we assume that they are small enough all right so in the le next lecture we're going to utilize these strains in order to relate strains to stresses which are the constitutive equations